We're getting flagged out from the back back there. <laughs> hey guys, welcome. Yeah, welcome this morning to Cornerstone Family Worship. If you would go ahead and stand with us if you are walking in, come on in. We're gonna need you to put your hands together this morning. You're gonna you're gonna put your hands together on the I'm just gonna go. Can I give you a little bit of coaching this morning? Um, this is not intuitive to me, but I'm just going to help give you a little bit of coaching. Okay, so when you put your hands together and you clap with us, you're going to clap on the two, four, right? Don't clap on the one, three on this first song. Clap on the two, four. If you're not sure what the two, four is, um, don't clap. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I hit your snare drum. That right there, you're going to clap with that on the first song. There you go. All right? All right, here we go.
So good to see everybody this morning. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to our time together. Let's ask God's blessings on this offering, if you would join me. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you, God, for your word and that we are encouraged, inspired, and motivated by the truth of who you are and what you said. We ask God your blessings on this offering and everything else that's said and done in this place today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said. Amen. Amen. Take your uh, bulletins if you would. If you're visiting with us today for the first time or the first time in a long time, uh, please fill out that golden card in there and turn that in at the end of the service. The guys will be out there waiting with a bucket. Um, I have a couple of announcements to make. There's more than I can actually go over. So what I would like for you to do is take a look at your bulletin, go through those announcements as best that you can. We are doing baptism here on October 28th in the Sunday morning service. So if you have not been baptized and you are a believer, I encourage you to sign up. Put that on your paper and uh, we will be in touch with you about that. We are also going to start in October what we call the second Sunday. It's a service that we will be doing in Eudora on the second Sunday of each month at 5 o'clock in the evening. And we invite you, encourage you to go down and join with our church down there and those lovely people. Our worship team will be going down and uh, I'll be speaking uh, in that service on 5 o'clock Sunday evening. Men's clay shoot, you need to sign up for that. You can do it at the welcome desk out there, the information desk. Uh, that'll be next Sunday, 4 p.m. Make sure you get signed up for that. Uh, CKC bingo night. Um, you, you must sign up today to be a part of the bingo night. I know some of you are way too holy to play bingo, but we, we're doing Christian bingo, so it's okay. Christian bingo. Uh, that's next Saturday at 5 p.m. I don't know what that means. I just do it. Also, men's breakfast. You have to sign up for that one also so they know how much food to cook. That is next Saturday. You can sign up for that on your Connect card on the back. Uh, drop it in again on your way out. They appreciate that. Baptism is also right there. Uh, ladies Progressive Dinner coming up on Saturday, October 20th. Women's Ministry is doing a lot of stuff. And if you'll look in your bulletins there, there's a whole column of things that they have coming up, things that they are doing. We invite you to be ladies, be a part of any of that that you can. The Encounter Group... We'll be doing a bonfire on October 19th. If you're wondering what that is, that's those uh, folks who are in their 20s to 40s and uh, uh, just enjoy getting together and doing, you know, hot, I don't know what they're going to do, hot dogs, s'mores, uh, something along those lines. But uh, everybody get signed up for something. Have fun. Also, last thing, on your way out today, they're going to hand you a sheet of paper that uh, Michelle worked so diligently to get together. It has described in that the teams uh, that we use for serving in the church. There are all types of, of teams, something that would fit you, I'm sure. All you need to do is grab one of those, find the thing you'd like to be a part of and help with, whether it's you know sound or worship or, or landscaping or coffee shop stuff, just whatever you'd like to be a part of. We encourage that. And, and the main reason is, is because being a Christian, being a godly person is about more than just going to church. It's about serving, isn't it? Amen. So let's all do something to serve other people and serve this community and serve, serve God. Let's all stand together. We're going to enter back into worship again. And as we always do, this next section, at least the first song or two, will be about prayer. So I'm going to ask you to pray for those people close to you, those people around you, people in your family that might need Christ, people that you work with, that you might be an example to them. You might
might have somebody else on your mind for something else. I will remind you that today at 4 o'clock, uh, we are doing the funeral service for John Brimmer right here. Everybody is invited to come. Uh, but pray for their family this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your willingness to listen and to hear the voice and cries of your people. We're asking, God, that you would move, stir our hearts and our minds, move in and among your people. This world may see you and all that we do. Give us each direction. Speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name we ask you.
midst of us. But Father, I I continue to hear that word this morning as we were worshiping. That word hindrance or hinder. And I was reminded of the scripture that that says that, that when God was speaking to his people, he said, You're hindered by your own affections. Six million kids, primary school age kids, that are going hungry. It's a crazy number, but there are 16,000 children who die every day of starvation. We're going to show a video, and I want you to see um, the the founder of Convoy of Hope, and I'll explain a little bit more about what we're going to do to help uh, with that around the world. It's really heartbreaking. When you think that 16,000 children die every day of hunger and water-related causes. But it doesn't have to be that way. With your help, we can truly save lives and we can restore them. One child, one mother, one father at a time. We've seen hope restored for thousands and thousands of children, just like Sherry, who now can wake up every morning knowing she has access to nutritious food and clean drinking water. And we've seen hope restored for thousands of mothers like Marisa, who is now off the streets and she's running her own business and feeding her own kids. And we've seen thousands of farmers who've seen the yields of their crops, the flocks, their herds all increase significantly. And now they're growing enough food to earn a living and care for their own families. It gets so easy, though, to look at the magnitude of the need and to tell ourselves that the problem is just too great. 
It's not. It's not. Together, we can change lives and give families a future. By participating in One Day to Feed the World, you're doing just that. You're saying that you want to save lives and you want to invite God's blessing on your life too. And so today, on behalf of all the children, the mothers, the farmers, and all the families whose lives will be changed forever, thank you for caring and thank you for giving. God bless you. Your one day of kindness transforms their every day. I first got to know Convoy of Hope uh, really up close and personal when uh, the tornado hit Joplin, Missouri. I was down there the next day. And uh, Convoy of Hope had already gotten there, taken over a warehouse, filled it up with food, clothing, and uh, toiletries for anybody who was in need. I've always respected their program. I've gotten to know some of the leadership uh, in Convoy of Hope. It is one of the few places you can send uh, a gift to help people. And basically 92% of anything you give goes directly toward the needs of others. They are functioning, operating right now on less than 8% administrative cost. Um, they do a great job with it. I've done a lot of research on them. I listened to a lot of the stuff they had to say. So we want to partic participate. I told them we would in the one day to feed the world. And what that basically means is each of us gives one day's salary. It's about, it's not just a compassionate gesture. It is the lifestyle of those who are compassionate um, to help those who are in need. Right now, Convoy of Hope feeds 177,000 children every day in 11 different countries. 177,000. It's more than that now. It's growing all the time because of the generosity and compassion of other people. So our day is going to be October 21st. It's going to be a regular Sunday, and, and we're going to receive our normal tithes and offerings. I'm talking about something above that. And you make a commitment. We've got brochures, um, information, literature to hand out next week and the week after. And uh, we even have these little stickers that you can put on and wear to work. This says you're part of the one day, um, and, and uh, people want to know about it. Now, this is open to anybody in our community that would like to participate in this. I, it's one of the few places that I know of I can guarantee you the money goes to what uh, they say it's going to go for. So remember that, October 21st, we're working our way up to it. It's one day's wage. You can take your total annual income, divide it by 365. Or you can divide it by 250, whatever, however many days you work. However you want to do that doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is our dollar here won't even buy you a cheeseburger anymore. But a dollar in one of these other countries will feed a kid for a couple of days. It just doesn't take much. Um, but I think that's what God give us, uh, has given us this wealth and prosperity for so that we can help other nations. If you're with me, say amen. amen. All right, I'm a, this is part two, week two of the Church Victorious. Today I want to talk about the Valley of Dry Bones. Uh, you, how many of you are familiar with that? Ezekiel 37. How many of you heard sermons on that? How many of you heard it recently? Oh, good. Oh, That's all right. Mine's different. It's going to be different. So it won't be the same. I mean, it's going to be the same scripture. Or, but. I'll tell you what got me to thinking about this, and that, that is the fact that... Um, I, I think that we are living in a world full of pain. I think we're living around people every day that are hurting and in trouble. They're not real sure. Uh, their pre prevailing and, and dominant thought every day is centered around fear and stress and anger. They're not real sure what is going to happen. They're not real sure how much control they really have over their circumstances and it's affecting every part of their life. And what I really believe is, is that there are a lot of people that are living. There's not very many that have life. That are really experiencing the kind of life that God gives. Somebody came up to me after the first service and they said, I remember you talking here a long time ago. And you said, be careful. Um, how did he say it? He said, be, you said, be careful not to quit living before you die. 
Because apparently that's what happens to a lot of people. And you see this, they just quit living. They're not dead yet. They still have some life, but they've quit, they've quit living. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1, he talks about some things here that deal with, I believe, a part of our life where we've never had more stuff than we have right now in this country. More playthings, more wealth, more entertainment. But, but living dry and lifeless is pretty normal for those around us. Such is the example here in the book of Ezekiel when God takes him into the valley of dry bones. And he says in verse 1, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. Behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered and said, God, only you know. Only God knows the question, the answer to the question. Can these bones live? Can we find some way to bring back to life those who may be living, they're standing, and it looks like they're alive, but something on the inside of them has died. There's no life left in them. Can God make these bones to live again? We're not questioning whether or not there's any life there in, these, in this valley. There obviously is no life. There's just dry bones. We don't question the future of something that is dead and dried up. It's over. It's, it, there's no more hope. The only real question with something that's dead and dry is can they be made alive again? It is a question I believe that only God can provide the answer to. I mean, we can say it, but we can't do it. God speaks it. And all things become possible. Maybe that was your question in the past week. Maybe that was the question of some people that were around you. Uh, maybe that was a question you came in here with this morning. Everything looks like it's dead. I don't know. You watch the news? It looks dead. It's, it looks dried up. It looks... Uh, like everything has gone wrong and, and, and there's no more hope. Is there any way things can change? And only God knows the answer to this and only God can bring the solution. But I believe He wants to reveal that answer to each one of us right here, right now. The valley is a battlefield where Ezekiel found these dry bones it wasn't a cemetery. It wasn't a place where they took dead people to bury them. This was a battlefield, and it was, it was strewn with bones, not just bones, but dry bones, dry and lifeless bones. These were not the bones of those who had lived a full and complete life. It was not those who just died of old age and were planted in the ground with respect and honor. It was those whose lives were cut short whose lives stopped, whose lives were unfulfilled and unfinished, a battlefield where, where lives ended, circumstances that were created by misguided the misguided direction of sinful humanity, some war, some fight, <coughs> caused by the battles of this life or the spiritual battle that we all face. And we are all in a spiritual battle. These bones are scattered through the, the valley of a battlefield. It is in verse 10 where it actually comes out and says uh, that when they did stand up, it was an exceeding great army. It calls them an army in verse 10. These were casualties of war, a battle that was fought and lost. They fought, but they lost. Number one, dry bones represent the absence of God in my life. <clears throat> what has really been on my mind lately is the possibility of revival. What has been in my heart and my mind has been, can God bring life back into a nation and into a people that have turned away from God? Can God stir up something on the inside of those who look religious but they have 
no life and no meaning and no value and no purpose? Can He restore something inside of each of us that would make it look like we are alive again? Here recently I reread through the, the infamous sermon by Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And I, 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 without taking anything away from the greatness of Jonathan Edwards, I want to say this. I don't think God is angry as much as He is heartbroken and grieved by the disobedience and blasphemy and rejection of Him and His Word, even by some people who call themselves Christians. I believe God's heart is broken. I know there's some people that see God as sitting up there in heaven all mad and angry and throwing bolts of lightning down this direction and causing bad things to happen in the life of a person to end their life suddenly and without, without cause. But I, I, all I can tell you is there is a lot more about God and His compassion and His heart to love the people than there is Him just trying to be mad and, and, and hurt them. I don't want to take anything away from what Jonathan Edwards did. But look, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I've come to the conclusion of late, I'm done with, with angry preachers. Do y'all know what I mean when I say angry preachers? People who stand up and scream and shout at you and they look mad and they look angry and they're, they're, they're telling you all the things that you're doing wrong in order to knock you down, beat you down, hold you down. I'm not there. I want you to know that I believe the passion and the compassion of God and the love of God is enough to change the heart of anybody if you will let it. I don't feel, and I hope, I hope you don't think I'm mad. I know sometimes my face looks mad. I got some mean looks. You want to see one? I got some mean looks, but I am not mad. What I do, I'm, it honestly comes from the bottom part of my heart because if it was not for the grace and the mercy and the passion and the compassion of God. I would have fallen a long time ago and I would have been just like one of these sets of bones in the valley, dry and dusty and without life. God is the one who wants to restore, and I believe it's in Lamentations 3 where he talks about how his mercies are new every morning. It's only because of his mercy we are not consumed. His passion, his compassion fails not. God is a... God is a loving God. Yes. I don't think, though, that that means God won't bring judgment. He will. But His motivation is love, and, and we need to remember that. Now, <clears throat> I hear the words over and over in my heart and in my ears about this battle and what it looks like. And, and uh, as, I, as I was thinking about this, and this is the first scripture that popped into my mind, John 10.10, where it says, the thief comes not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life. That you might have it more abundantly. And while God is offering life, and abundant life, and eternal life, there are too many casualties on the battlefield of the spiritual. Because the thief has stolen, and killed, and destroyed. What you might have once had in your relationship with God that felt so fulfilling and, and so great has somehow or another been lost or stolen or destroyed. And now you wonder from day to day if I even have enough to get to heaven. I've done these Bible studies for years and years with a room full of you know, 8, 10, 12, 15 older people in their 80s and their 90s. And I, I've heard the question more times than I care to repeat. When, when you see somebody that's gone to church their whole life for 80 or 90 years, and then they ask you the question one-on-one, -on -one, I'm not sure. How can I know that I'm going to heaven? What has happened to the soul of a person who served God and gone to church their whole life, and somehow or another they get toward the end of their life, and they realize they're not even sure they have eternal life. Look, God wants us to be sure. He wants us to know. He gives us everything that we need. You and I both know, when you see a pile of bones, you're driving down the highway or whatever, and you see a pile of bones, um, you wonder what it was. 
You do not wonder what it is. You know what it is. It's a pile of dead bones. But the question is, what was it? What might it have been? But we already know it's a pile of bones. Dry bones represent death, not life. These dry bones are talking and, and looking about things that are dead. Dry bones are a sure sign that there's no life left. Nothing attached, no, no thing of life attached to it. There are even religious things that we have attached ourselves to that have no life in them. Now, I don't, I'm not going to go into all of the deep, but you know what I'm talking about, right? We get into the habit of going, and I see this. I, I see we maybe go to church or we, we listen to the songs or we do this. But listen, the programs and, and, and the, the routine of it is not where life is found. It's found in a relationship. And there's people that stand in churches all over this world on Sunday mornings and they sing the songs, but they have no connection with life. It's just a song. And I, I watch people sometimes um, in, in the way that they live in the community, knowing that they go to church. And you wonder, why, what, how, what do you give up when you walk out of there on Sunday morning? What is it that goes away that causes you to no longer live by hope and, and peace that comes from God? It's, they've lost the life in the relationship with Christ, the spiritual battle that we all face. They're losing. They're losing. John 6, 63, Jesus said, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit. And they are life. Number two, dry bones reveal the desperate need for God's revival. God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? And I say we need a restoration of life in this country. We need God to revive us as a nation. We need God to revive us as a church, a global church, the church as a whole. But more important than any of that, we need God to revive us Personally, we need God to move in our life individually. We need restoration of life. When we think of spiritual lifelessness, some people may immediately think of places like Washington, D.C. or Los Angeles, California or, or Las Vegas or Sodom and Gomorrah. And we always want to push it out there somewhere. But really, it, if it's going to change, it has to start in the heart of who we are. And our way of thinking, Jeremiah 23, 10 describes a dry place when he said, The land is full of adulterers, for because of swearing, the land mourns. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their course is evil, and their force is not right. Our land, our generation is dying, and churches are drying up. And the main, the, the, the people that preach, the people that stand in the, in the pulpit or behind the lecterns or in the Sunday school classes. And many times the ones we see on TV or, or whatever the case may be, some people that you might know close and personally, they're losing because they're drying up on the inside. All of the frustrations of this world and the evil things that are going on around us causes us to begin to doubt God. We're going to lose life before we die. Where are the believers who have a white hot passion to live every day for Christ when you can shut off all of the things that other people are doing against you? I, do you think I don't struggle with that? You, you think maybe there's times where I don't struggle with the things that other people have said? Even, well, even when I know they, don't, they have no idea what they're talking about. They don't know me and they're, they're judging me. You, you know what I'm talking about? You have people that say things about you. You have people that disagree with you. You have circumstances that come up in your life and you don't know how to fix it. You don't know how to change it. Well, are you living all of this in the flesh? Because if you do, you're going to get it wrong. Your response is going to be wrong. God has called you to something greater. And that is that you have on the inside of you that white hot passion. To believe God for the things that He has said. And to live for Him every day. Regardless of what other people are doing. Regardless of what they're saying. 
Regardless of the circumstances, you can hold it together because there's nothing great about this life unless Christ is at the center of it. If you agree, say amen. amen. Psalm 63, 1 says, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you, and my soul is thirsty for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. To see your power and your glory just like I have seen in your sanctuary. Those moments and times when you're in church and we're, we're singing, worshiping, praising God, or the Holy Spirit speaks to you in the moment, in the preaching that moment where you feel closer to God than what you have in, in quite some time or maybe even ever. He's saying that's the same kind of, of love and longing for His presence that you need to take with you out into a dry and dusty society and let them see Christ in you and the way that you live. We cannot rest in past achievements. I appreciate the, the testimonies and we're trying to get more testimonies to, to share with you about those things. There are a lot of good things that have happened in our past and in your past. But listen, dry bones find no strength or victory by hanging on to the past. We should remind ourselves sometimes of the great, thing that, the great things that God has done in us and for us. But listen, the church, uh, many believers uh, have had great victories and, and had a very strong past but when things are dry, those victories of the past don't help. They might encourage you a little bit, but those things don't help. And what I'm trying to say is, it, it, as, as hard as things may get, we have to keep our focus forward. We have to keep looking to God. We have to renew ourselves in the strength and the commitment and the life that He gives us, that He puts on the inside of us. We have to be reminded of that every day. We, we need to be renewed in that relationship every day. That's why Romans 12 too, talks about how we are renewing our mind. Let your minds be renewed day by day. That, that's, that's part of our relationship and our responsibility with Him. Number three, dry bones is another way of saying they have no hope. Hope, biblical hope, is not just about wishing. It's not, not I wish things will get better. That's not biblical hope. It's about believing and moving toward what you believe to be true about God. That's hope. Do you really believe God enough to keep moving toward those things that you believe about Him? That's how hope is, is born inside of us. I have hope. I, my hope goes beyond the resources of this world. My hope goes beyond the enemies of this world. My hope is fixed on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Right? I mean, we, we have to have something on the inside of us that's just as real, if not more real, than the circumstances we're stuck in here. Ezekiel 37, 11 <clears throat> says, Then God said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of the graves and bring you into a land, into the land. Godly hope comes by hearing the word of God. When he speaks, it's about life. It's about hope. It's about promise of a future. Hearing the wrong voices will bring dryness and death. And we spend maybe too much of our time listening to the other voices around us. When God speaks, His purpose is, is to add life and value and purpose to each one of us. They said we are without hope and we are cut off. That is, so far as we are concerned, there is nothing in us alive. This is what it means when He says, when the people said we are cut off. It's like a branch that's cut off of a tree. It's going to lay there and it's going to wither and it's going to die and it's going to become brittle. Or if you lose a limb, unfortunately, an arm or a leg or something like that, that, that lost limb cannot sustain life apart from the body. That's what they were saying. That was the testimony of the dry bones. We have been cut off. There's no life <coughs> left in us. The very essence of life has dried up. It's gone. Taken away or given away? 
I don't, I don't know the answer when it comes to dry bones, but I can tell you when it comes to the lives of many people, it's not taken away the life. It's given away. There's a choice there to be made, and there is a difference. God didn't take it. They gave it away. I find it extremely interesting, interesting in, in, uh, in Psalm 51 where David, this, his great repentance song, he begins to talk about God restoring the bones which he has broken, not the bones which he has dried up. As long as you can see God for who he really is, you have to know God's plan for you and I is not for us to die and dry up spiritually. There may be times where God breaks bones, but God breaks bones to get attention in order to grow and become stronger. Some of the strongest bones you have are the bones that have been broken. Is that right? Am I right? I think I'm right. Once it heals up, it's stronger than it was before. God may break bones at times, but those bones that He breaks, it's for a good purpose and a good reason. God is not in the business of drying up your bones. Um, number four, the only solution is in the sovereignty of God. The life we need, the thing we are searching for, can only come through God. True life begins when we identify what only God can do. We, we need to be able to focus on and see those things that I can't fix. I know sometimes people think, well, you know, the preacher, he can fix it, or mom can fix it, or dad can fix it. There are a lot of things in this world that you and I cannot fix for other people. But there is nothing that God can't do. All things are possible with God. We need to recognize the sovereignty of God. That there, if we're going to ask God to help us to live again, there are parts of our life that only God can bring life to. Ezekiel 37, 13, God said, You shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Many have only wondered up to this point what that might look like um, to come up out of the grave. God says you're going to know. At that, at that moment, you shall know that I am Lord. I think he says it three or four times in just this 37th chapter. Part of what God is doing is, is giving us what we might need in order to know that He is God. Uh, John the Apostle said it, and he said it twice in the New Testament. He said, these things have I written that you might know that you have salvation, that you're going to heaven, that you can follow the Son of God, that Jesus is the Christ. God wants us to know. Uh, but if He can bring life to dead and dry bones, you'll know forever that He is God. You'll know that God can restore anything, that He is Lord. When you trust Him to do what only He can do, He is the Lord, the only one who can open graves. He's the only one who can bring people up out of their despair and, and, and their dryness. And we, and we talk about this, but do we really believe it? Do we believe it for other people? And not ourselves. If God is everything that He says He is, and I will, I will remind you, God is the only one that can raise the dead. But the Bible even encourages us in that. Doesn't the Bible say that the, uh, the eastern sky will split and the dead in Christ will rise first? The graves will give up the dead. Oh, grave, where is your, your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? That we will, uh, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those of us which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. There will be no more question beyond that point whether or not God has the power to raise the dead and restore the dry. That is the moment that all of this will become uh, common information. It'll be just plain common sense. Now you have to receive it by faith that God does want to move in your life. And you may feel like at times, I'm ready to give up. I don't know why everything has gone bad. I don't know why it's as hard as what it is. You need to know if God can raise the dead, open the grave, He can also bring life back into you. Yes. When you feel dead and when it feels like you're dry. We, we though, in this nation, in our, in our culture, we spend all of our time pursuing the wrong things. Better jobs, newer cars, bigger houses. Those things are not bad in and of themselves, but those things will not bring life 
They will not restore. How many of you have seen this before? Well, if I could just get that new house, everything would be better in my life. I'd, it'd change everything. I'd be happy forever if I could just get that. And then you get that new house, and the two years down the road, you know, first time the hot water heater quits working, everything is over. It just becomes normal, average. There is one part of life that can be restored and can be renewed each and every day, and that is the part of you that attaches itself to the, to the Spirit of God that gives life. And every day can be lived in the sovereignty of who He is. The sovereignty of God is the only answer to abundant life. Nothing else satisfies. Uh, Jesus has already identified the reason for the dry bones as well as the solution to the dry bones. Remember, I already quoted it once, John 10.10. 10. The thief is the one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That is... That is the, the problem. That's the reason for dry bones. But he also gave the solution. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That abundant life is available to you each and every day. The sovereign hand of God works to bring life when we give in to his ways. When he said in, in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. It's, it's not just a, a suggestion. It's, it's not like the speed limit sign out on the highway. No, wait, those aren't suggestions. I'm sorry. It's not a suggestion. He's saying this, this, this is what will change your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All this other stuff will be added to you. Can I just tell you this too? It's not too late. It's not too late. If God in His sovereignty can bring life back into the dead and dry bones, if He can raise the dead and heal the sick, He can start something new in those who are willing to commit to His ways. It's never too late. As long as you have breath, it's not too late. God can start to restore you in your life now. That's why the New Testament says things like, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I'm going to shift gears now. i got a couple more points. We're good on time, right? You everybody okay? okay. I, have I ever told you that the first verse that I ever memorized was Proverbs 10, 29? When it said, the, ways, the way of the Lord is strength to the upright. There's something about following after God's ways that will strengthen you like nothing else will. I knew the first time that I ever read that, it was probably one of the most important verses that I would ever realize. Because everybody in this world is looking for some kind of a strength right now. And they're looking for something that will get them through, something that will get them up, something that will that'll make them alive again. Even though they're living, they're feeling like they're dead, but there's got to be something from God that will make me alive again, and it is the ways of God. Commit yourself to His ways. Uh, Psalm 103, 7, that's what I said it was in the first service. I still don't know for sure that's where it's at. But God said, my ways have I made known unto Moses, but my acts unto the children of Israel. The children of Israel, all they wanted to see was, uh, show us another miracle, show us a manifestation, give us more manna. You do this stuff for us. Whereas Moses was learning something different. He was learning the ways of God. You ready for something in your life to change? You ready to understand something more about living? I mean living. There are a lot of people that are alive. They ain't living. And God wants us to be alive. He wants us to just not, not just have life. He wants us to have abundant life and eternal life. When does eternal life begin? That's not when you die. That's when you get Christ in your life. Amen. Eternal life begins when you surrender your life to Him. A. If God says it, He will give us the strength to accomplish it. Verse 7 of Ezekiel 37 said this. God said, And I will bring upon, uh, flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Again, three times he says, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel said, I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. 
God is telling us He will put things back together again. God can strengthen that which has been broken or separated. I want to ask you a question, and I get this question every now and then about uh, funerals. Is it okay if Christians are cremated? Um, it's one of those issues that uh, I can't answer to your conscience, but I can answer to the power of God. Uh, how many times have there been house fires or other types of fires where people were burned up? Uh, to, no trace, nothing but ashes. Does that exclude them from God raising them from the dead like He does everybody else? What about those who are buried at sea uh, that the fishes have scattered across the Pacific or the Atlantic? Does that mean that God can't pull them back together? Look, God is able and God will do it. doesn't matter how far apart the bones are. He said, bone to His bones. Bone comes together. It reforms what God had already uh, once made. God is able to do that. If God is able to do that, how much more can He bring together the soul of who we are with the mind of who He's made us to be and live in a way that brings Him honor and glory and, and happiness and pleasure uh, uh, through us? I mean, if, there, if God can raise the dead, if He can pull bones back together and reconstruct ashes to make a person, why couldn't He then, if we're willing to let Him, change our life in a way that we now become everything that He wants us to be in the flesh? I believe it's totally possible that God can use us, but you know what you have to do? You have to quit letting other people push you around, shove you around, change who God has made you to be. You have to keep your focus on the things of Christ, the things of God. When the word of the Lord becomes a priority, noise happens. When you make the word of God your priority, like he said, like he says in this verse, he said, so when I prophesied as I was commanding, uh, or I prophesied as I was commanded, as I prophesied, there was a noise. Right when he began to speak the word, the bones began to come together again. Wasn't it God who said, My word will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish whatever I sent it to do. This is the word of God. I think we, we look at it too lightly most of the time. We think, Word of God, that's the Bible. That thing's over 3,000 years old or 2,000 years old. How can we know for sure? Because within the word, the written Word of God is the physical Word of God that changes everything, but it does not change. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will endure forever. It will remain forever. When He spoke the Word, He could hear the noise of the bones coming back together. There will be a noise of restoration and vindication of life and hope those things will come back together when you and I learn how to, to speak the Word of God. So, so here's what I think. No matter where you are, God can give you the strength or the power to go and do what He said in order to become what He wants you to be. If God can do this to, to scatter dry bones, if He can put life back into it, then don't you think that he's, He can do something with our life, with your life and with mine? Why do we quit? Why do we give up so easily? Why do we give in to that which feels dry and dead? God has, if there's any, if there's any generation, if there's any uh, era in which the body of Christ, the believers in God should rise up and really be passionate about fulfilling God's word, it should be us. We have more, we have more resources than ever before. We should, we should be glowing when we walk out of here. People, people should see Jesus in us. <clears throat> he said, speak life. Say to those bones, preach to the dead and the dry, and God will do the rest. Speak life. Not criticism. Not sarcasm. You want to get caught up in all that stuff? Go ahead. You'll be just like the rest of the world. Everything that somebody says to you, you can find a reason you don't like it. You want to argue about it. You, you, want, to, you want to stop them. Whatever. S criticism, sarcasm, and hate. That's, that's the vocabulary of the, word, of the world. 
In, in other words, if we are going to experience life and revival, we have to do this thing God's way. 1 John 5.16 says, When we see others sin, we should pray that God will give them life. When we see other people sin, what's our, the, the church normally does is we point it out. Straighten up. You better straighten up. People go to hell for doing that. We, they know what we think. God says you need to speak life on their behalf. You should be praying for them. You don't have to fix them. You don't, have to, you don't even have to correct them. When God is able to get you to do everything that He wants you to do, then God will begin to do things in others that you would never be able to do. You have to get this part right <clears throat> first. First, there are those who appear to be upright, but they have no strength. They're standing and they look like they're alive, but they, they have no strength of God to move or to really live. Number one, some will dry up, some will give up, but the church needs to rise up. There, when I say the church needs to rise up, there are several things about that, that that we need to look at. We must allow God to, to stand us up again. The church has gotten a bad rap, I believe, over the last several years. Decades and maybe over a couple of generations. I think the church has gotten a bad rap because we've been trying to do too much of this on our own. We got all the programs and we got all the stuff that looks like we as a church are propped up and that we are alive. But listen, there, there's a lot of things that go on in churches that have no life to them. There's no life. You know, we talk about membership here and I know lots of people have, have you know, joined the church over the years. And you know what? They, some people have a hard time believing it when they, they say, what do I have to do to become a member of Cornerstone? And we say, just say you are and you are. We don't make you go through stuff. We don't, we don't force you to try to learn things and memorize things and make promises that you and we, I both know you can't keep. You ever heard those stories? You have to stand up in front of the whole church and raise your right hand and say, I will never do this, and I will never do this, and I will always do that, and I'll never do that. You're making people lie with their hand raised. <laughs> Most of the time they got their hand on the Bible. Look, that's not the way we are. I believe, here's my opinion, and we started this, what, 15, 16 years ago? Oh, yesterday was Lisa and I's anniversary. 28 years. She's put up with me. Twenty-eight years, but, but anyway, we've been in this church since '02, May of '02, so 16 years, and we started this whole membership <laughs> thing because, in my opinion, if you've given your life to Christ and you followed through with biblical repentance and you've asked Christ into your life, you are now a member of the body of Christ, the family of God. What can we add to that as a church that's going to really help? Not much. I don't, I, we're not making a club. We're not making something exclusive over here. We want you to be a member of the body of Christ, a member of God's family. And then that's all that counts to me. We want you to be a member here. So all you have to do is say, hey, I want to be a member. And, and we'll make you, you know, no, we don't make you do anything. You have to go get a donut, I think, and drink some coffee. And you're a member. You're automatically part of the family when you do that. <clears throat> Psalm 34, 19 talks about how we sometimes suffer as believers. It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Hebrews 5, 8 says that even Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Those around us may be drying up. They may be uh, giving up on life or on each other, but the power of God has something better for the church. 2 Corinthians 4 8 says that we are pressed on every side but not crushed. Listen, this is what it means. When you have the life of Christ in you, the, the breath of God breathing through you, when you're moving in God's direction, you may be pressed on every side but not crushed. Perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but never destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that His life might be seen in our body. That the life of Christ may be seen in the life that we live, the body that we have, the way that we act around others. 
The way that we respond, yes, we're going to be persecuted. But listen, you're not going to be forsaken. God's not going to leave you just because things get tough. You may be pressed on every side, but you're not going to be crushed. There's more. Who, who can fear the, uh, death in this world knowing that God alone gives eternal life? How can we really fear all that stuff? Without His life working in you, we're nothing more than, and I know that they're, 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 we're nothing more than a zombie. Does anybody here watch the zombie things? I didn't tell Michelle this earlier. She would have had a picture of a zombie up here for you. But apparently a zombie is you know, the walking dead. Is that, the, is that a show, a movie? Day, night of the walking dead or something. Don't laugh at me. Young people laughing at me like that old guy. You know. All I know is, is zombies are dead people that are walking around trying to fulfill some desire that they have that they cannot even tell you what that desire is. From a spiritual perspective, our world is nowadays full of zombies. People who look like they're alive and they're walking around because of their flesh and their desires that they have that they cannot even articulate. And it causes them to do things that are damaging and hurtful to other people. Zombies! God wants us to have something real and something living and something alive. Oh, can I tell you, that I don't, I've never, I can't think of any zombie movie that I've watched, but I've seen enough commercials. I need to tell you something about zombies. If we do have a zombie apocalypse, I'm going to tell you how to stay alive and to live through it. Because I've seen enough about zombies, I know. You ready? Run. They don't, they don't run. I mean, who can't outrun that? Even with a walker, you can, a wheelchair, you can, you can outrun that. Just run. But listen, God has something better for us in that while the rest of the world around us may be with the walking dead, He wants to put life inside of us. It's what it means to have a, 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 living, a living soul Something on the inside of us that is about life. It's living. It's active. It's the Word that brings it to life. And that's what he says about the Word. It's living. It's active. It's, it's, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It brings life to things that don't have any life in them. We think sometimes that we are a body. You think of uh, Ron Swain. You think of this. And, and that we have a soul. When the reality is, we are a soul. The eternal part of us is who we really are. We just have a body for a period of time. And so God transforms that which is mortal, mortal into immortality. But you know the thing about a zombie is, is they, they can't even identify who they are or what they want. And people that are getting shook around now and they become whatever other people want them to be, they don't even know their own identity. And neither can they identify, identify specifically what they need or who they are. If we're never able to allow God to work in us, we will never fully know who God has created us to be. Let the life of God come alive in you. Here's the last one. When you, when you get up, Take a deep breath. Why don't you do it with me? We're all going to take a deep breath all at the same time. One, two, three. Doesn't that feel good? It feels good sometimes just to take a good deep breath. Here, here's the condition that most of God's army might be in these days. These bones in Ezekiel 37 had come together. They had put, God put flesh back on them and he put muscle inside of them and they all stood up. If I'd have had more time, I was going to have about 10 people come up here and, be, and just stand. Because that's what it looked like in this valley of dry bones when God put the bodies back together. And they're all standing now. A whole army is standing out there. But there's no life in them. They're just standing. There's a lot of people in a lot of churches that look like they're standing. It looks like they're doing a really good job of standing. But there's no life on the inside of them. And so then he comes along in verse 9 and God said... To Ezekiel, he said, prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus says the Lord God, 
Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. They're not living. They're just standing. They look like they're alive, but they're not. They're dead. They got no breath. There's no, there's no breath in them. Wind and breath and breathe are the same word in the Hebrew. It's the word Hebrew word ruach. It's translated wind and, and breath, but it's also translated spirit. In Genesis 1-1 where the Bible says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and the, the darkness was upon the face of the earth and the spirit moved across the face of the waters. Capital S, spirit. Spirit of God. That word spirit is the same word that's used here for wind and breath. It's the Hebrew word ruach. Without the Spirit, there's no life. There's no life apart from the breath of the Spirit of God in you. Don't get the idea that Ezekiel's ministry was any easier than ours is today. The exiles he ministered to were depressed. They, they were defeated and enslaved. They had no hope. They were in bondage and oppression by wicked rulers and evil circumstances, just like we face today. There are things around us all the time that are trying to suck the wind out of us. Suck the spirit, the life out of us. They were so overwhelmed, it appears that they had given up. They started saying, God, where are you? They, they lost their desire to worship. They were standing up and they looked like they were alive, but there was no breath in them. In Psalm 137, it talks about the, the, uh, those of Israel that were in exile in, in Babylon in those days. And they basically got to the point where they threw their hearts up in the tree because their captors were saying, you're supposed to be happy. Sing us a song and make us happy. You should be joyful even though you're in captivity. Sing. They threw their hearts up in the trees because they had nothing else to worship. They had nothing else to worship over. They had nothing else to be happy about. So go back and read Psalm 137 and you'll, you'll see we, they were plundered by the enemy and they wondered the whole time, God, where are you at? Now we're stuck in a strange land dominated by everything but our God. What do we have to sing about? They threw their instruments away. They had no breath left in them to worship. They seemed seems to be the attitude of a lot of people in, in, in modern churches. Yeah, they, they'll worship and serve God when things are going good, when they're going the way we want them to. But if they don't, then they start saying things like, God has forsaken us and we're stuck in a place that we don't want to be. And I'm mad at God and I don't care who knows it. I'm mad at God. No breath. There's no breath left. If and when the church stands up without the breath of God, it comes across as cold and calculated, callous to the needs of others because though it's upright, it has no life in it. Our worship team is going to come back. I'm going to close, but I'm going to do it pretty quick. And they're going to sing as we're leaving here today. But I, I want you to see this. I want you to know there's a whole bunch of people that are propped up and it looks like they're alive. There's even churches that are propped up and it looks like they're alive, but they have no life on the inside of them. And when I read that scripture earlier about the thief, that's Satan, and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And it may be that the one thing, the one reason that churches everywhere, Christian believers, people who say that they are of God, have quit talking about the Holy Spirit is because they've been lied to. It's been a concept stolen from them, killed, destroyed. They don't think that there's any reality to it. I'm not talking about stuff that seems weird and far out. I get questions about the Holy Spirit all the time. But listen, the Holy Spirit is as much a part of God as Jesus is the Son of God. The Holy Spirit we must have. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away because if I go away, then I will send the Holy Spirit. And there are people who refuse and reject the idea of the Holy Spirit because of the example that some have set forth in our history, in our past. 
You need to see that without the Holy Spirit, there's no breath and there's no life. And we have to ask. We, we need to ask. Anytime you see me praying up front before service or after service, or you, you follow me around, and I'm asking God all the time, fill me again with your Holy Spirit. I need the Spirit of God in me to keep living because it seems like most of what I deal with is death. And tragedy and despair and those who have turned their back on God and those who have quit or given up and they've got no life. Holy Spirit, come. Fill me again. Make me everything you want me to be. Don't you let the enemy of your soul pervert or steal that which God has promised when He promised His Holy Spirit, He said He will guide you into all truth. He will show you things to come. He will convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment. You have no life without the Holy Spirit of God. You might be living, but you have no life and breath. You would stand with me and we're going to close in a word of prayer and just bow your heads right where you are and maybe maybe you've heard all kinds of things about the Holy Spirit and you don't know what to believe anymore. I'm not asking you to do anything except invite the Holy Spirit into your heart and into your life again for guidance, for direction, for truth, for peace, for, for the amazing results that comes from a heart and mind totally given over to God. If you're in here today and you're not sure, you don't know that you feel like you're living, you're alive, but you don't feel like you're living, I want to ask you to do what the Word says, and that is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be not drunk with wild wear and success, but be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. He will bring life to a place that's only been painful in the past. And if that's you this morning and you just need, you need more of God, you need the reality of God, you need the truth of the Spirit, not anything weird or, 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 or anything, you just need the Spirit of God in you. While everybody else has their head, head bowed, I'm going to ask you just lift up your hand and receive the Holy Spirit. Come on, just lift it up. You need the Holy Spirit. I do too. My hand's up. I need the Holy Spirit to be more alive and more real in me and through me than ever before. I need the life that comes through the Holy Spirit of God. I believe everywhere in this room, anybody lifted up their hand, I believe that is happening in you right now. That God is going to show you what it really means to live and to be alive. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. I wish you would be. You're going to be alive in Christ. Heavenly Father, I'm asking for every person in this room, whether they raise their hand or not, that you would make yourself more real to them than you've ever been before. That you would give them glimpses, little windows to look into of what it means to really be alive in Christ. To really be living. The things of this world become dim because of the light of the glory of who you are. Show us, God, more about you. Reveal more of yourself to us that we might become everything you need us to be in this generation. God, I ask that you would protect each person in this room also, that your blessings would be upon them. Go with them now, each in their separate directions. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. I mean, look, if you made any kind of a decision for Christ today, we have some envelopes up here in the front that I'd like to give to you, and we will help you in any way that we can uh, to take that next step. God bless you. Have a great day. Give the Lord a hand one more time. Here you go.